Welcome back to the Lydia Magruder channel. I'm going to continue talking today about the epistemic importance of religious context in relationship to Jesus' ministry and then the claim of his resurrection. So you'll remember last time, if you listened or watched last time, I said that we shouldn't really think that the Jesus Seminar is admitting anything all that exciting when they say that um, Jesus probably quote-unquote healed at least one blind man because they're really just talking about a psychosomatic healing and that's admitting very little beyond the admission that Jesus existed as someone that a lot of people had a lot of faith in. Um, so that someone might psychosomatically get over some ailment because he's believing in Jesus, this, this well thought of religious teacher and alleged healer. And that's really just part of the definite description of Jesus anyway. But then I said that today I would be talking about what is correct about the intuition that there's something important about the religious context of Jesus' ministry. So let's make a contrast here. Um, suppose that a friend of yours said that a neighbor of his one day discovered that he could fly. So this neighbor is just some guy living in suburban America who was standing on his lawn one day and, and sort of flapped his arms and find, found himself flying. Um, I think we have a pretty strong instinct, and I think there's something to this instinct, that that's different from the claim that Jesus rose from the dead, and that part of the difference lies in the religious context of the latter. The former is just a bizarre event. It's like the claim that a two-headed baby was born, or that someone saw the Yeti in the in the wilderness, or something. It's just a weird thing. Um, the way we can think of it is that the existence of God, whatever other information we might have about the existence of God, doesn't really raise the probability of that specific event that this man suddenly found himself able to fly, um, because there's no religious context to it at all. Um, similarly, the 19th century skeptic T.H. Huxley once um, mocked at the idea of believing in Jesus' resurrection on the basis of the testimony of the disciples because he said that even if 12 men told him that a centaur was seen walking down Piccadilly in London, he wouldn't believe it. And a response that springs to mind for that is that the centaur is just a random wonder. It has no religious context. Now, this whole point is related to some extent to the um, what's sometimes called the classical apologetics approach. So keep watching because as a bonus, I'm going to be talking later in this very same video about what's wrong with that classical, that strong classical approach that you first have to argue that God exists before arguing for historic miracles. So don't go away if you want to hear that. But there, there does seem to be something to the idea that it matters that Jesus has a religious context. Okay, now I'm putting aside for now and trying to disentangle something like C.S. Lewis's Liar, Lunatic, or Lord Trilemma. I'm trying to disentangle and set aside for now um, Tom Gilson's Too Good to be False argument. And I'm trying to, about Jesus... And I'm trying to disentangle and set aside for now any argument that, that Jesus himself fulfilled prophecy like um, by his manner of death. I'm going to talk about that stuff later because that's specific information that seems to indicate that Jesus really was who he said he was. So when I speak of religious context today, I'm talking about something much broader. I'm talking about the idea that Jesus uh, presented himself as representing the Jewish God, that he was a Jew, that he affirmed that, you know, 
the law would not pass away till it was all fulfilled. Um, he presented himself as at least a prophet, as a messenger from God within a context where it was believed that God does sometimes send messengers, okay? And he said that his miracles were uh, verification of his uh, prophetic status, his status as the son of God and a messenger of God. So again, these are all just claims, okay? But that he was himself sort of placing it in that context and he even predicted his own uh, resurrection. Okay, so he kind of set that up as a test or a sign. Um, that seems to make it different from the centaur in Piccadilly or the random suburbanite who finds himself able to fly. But why? Why? Um, and we need to be simultaneously not ignoring that and not overstating its force. Now, one way that we can put this is that the religious context of Jesus' ministry, such as I've just described, acts as a channel or a conduit for evidential relevance in a couple of different directions. I've talked about epistemic routing a lot on this channel, and you can find me talking about it elsewhere. Sometimes there are propositions that aren't directly evidential in and of themselves. They don't they don't directly amount to showing that someone is who he claims to be, but they make other things relevant. So an analogy you could think of would be, um, suppose that your ultimate proposition of interest is that a certain horse won a certain horse race, okay? Now, it's obviously in one sense relevant to that, to say that that horse race exists and that that horse is entered in it. Okay, obviously if that race doesn't even exist at all, then the horse can't win it because it doesn't exist, okay? Or if the horse hasn't been entered in the race, he can't win it because he isn't in the race. Um, so you can say in that sense that if that question is raised, is there even such a race? Is there even such a thing? And you can bring forward evidence that there is and can show a list of, of those who have been entered in it and this, this horse is among them. That is relevant, but it's not relevant in the same sense as specific evidence that that horse won. Video evidence, a report in a newspaper or something like that. In one sense, it raises the probability of the proposition compared to what it would be if there were no such race, okay, but not any ways beyond that of anybody else whose horse has entered in the race, okay? So that's just kind of a, a loose analogy. Um, the, the proposition that Jesus was in this religious context, that he claimed to represent the God of Israel and so forth, is a channeling proposition like the proposition that the race uh, horses entered in the race okay so then if you have independent evidence that the god of israel actually exists and i mean independent aside from jesus claimed miracles aside from the evidence for jesus resurrection so theistic proofs um maybe arguments from other prophecy, other Old Testament prophecy unrelated to the Messiah, um, arguments from the existence of the Jews, for example, things like that, um, arguments for the truth of the Old Testament, that kind of thing. Then the religious context of Jesus' ministry channels that evidence to the person of Jesus so that at least he becomes what we might call an, uh, someone we are interested in that we're seeing as being in the race, okay? Now, let's not get overly excited. There are a lot of phonies who are in that same race, okay? We could, we could say it looks like Simon Magus in Acts claimed to represent that same God, okay? But uh, as the young people might say today, if if God exists, and specifically the God of the Jews, then prophets are a thing, okay? 
are, are profits a thing? Okay, if we have evidence that profits are a thing, profits for God, because God exists and he sometimes sends profits, then Jesus might be one of them. It's maybe not saying a whole lot, but it is saying something beyond where we would be if there were no God or if God were the deist God and never sent any messages to man, then prophets wouldn't be a thing, right? Okay, so um, now comes the little bonus section, the aside that I mentioned earlier about um, about cl the classical approach. So the classical approach to apologetics is that you must argue first that God exists and only then argue for a specific miracle like Jesus' resurrection. You've got to do it in that order. Now that's wrong. Epistemologically, if that's made as an epistemological statement, it's wrong. And I think what it's doing is really confusing psychology, <clears throat> rhetoric, that kind of thing, with epistemology. There are people, maybe a lot of them, um, who will be significantly assisted by uh, breaking through their atheism first with other arguments for the existence of God and the existence of a God who might reveal himself to us with a message and so forth. So that can certainly be helpful, but that is not epistemologically actually necessary. And, and there's actually math that can show why this is the case. Probability is a two-way street. If the existence of God is probabilistically relevant to the resurrection, then the resurrection is epistemologically relevant to the existence of God. If you're listening to this on podcast, I'm pointing my hands in opposite directions here, okay? Um, so if we get specific, strong evidence that Jesus rose from the dead after predicting it and claiming to be a representative of God, then that should actually alter a skeptic's probability that God exists. If it doesn't, he's not being rational if the, if the evidence is really strong. But people are sometimes irrational. A metaphor for this uh, fact of two-way relevance would be suppose that you have three glasses in a row and the middle one is a measuring cup. Okay, you could tell I do a lot of cooking. I like to cook. Okay, so you've got water in both of the glasses on either side, you have a measuring cup in the middle. You pour the water from the left glass, and then you pour the water from the right glass. And if you haven't spilled any, the measurement in the measuring cup is going to be to a certain level. And suppose you do it in a different order. First you pour the water from the right glass, and then you pour the water from the left glass. Well, again, if you haven't spilled anything, the measurement's going to be exactly the same. The order should not matter. The order, order, in fact, does not matter. So it's the same way with epistemology and probability. If once we once we take into account the evidence that both that God exists and uh, all of that, and that, that Jesus rose from the dead, the probability is just going to be what it is. The proper probability, order shouldn't matter. But sometimes certain orders can be enlightening to people or helpful to people or something like that. So that's why the, the strong classical position is actually wrong. Okay, so I don't agree that we have to argue that God exists first. But I also agree that God's existence is, is relevant because it could mean that there are such things as prophets. Um, I think sometimes in the West, and I've said this before, we're over-focused on refuting naturalism. And we don't realize how far there still is to go. I once had someone tell me verbally that he believes once you show that God exists, um, the God of traditional theism, you've done about 90% of the work to uh, support the, the proposition that Christianity is true, including that Jesus rose from the dead. And my jaw just about dropped. Showing that God exists is not 90% of the work. Um, and, and showing that even that naturalism is false, it, it just brings you to a point where now we've got a class of um, supposed miracles and we got to sort out the 
the, the fake from the real here, okay? And there's still a ton of work to be done at that point. So let's not get overly excited. Um, we're still, uh, imagine a race, a horse race that has, you know, thousands of participants or something like that, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to know very much just because you know that this horse has been entered in the race. Now, next time I want to talk about um, more specific evidence about Jesus that tends to show that he was special. Okay. So here we're acknowledging there is something right about the epistemic context thing, because it makes our information that God exists relevant, at least to Jesus, in a way that it's not relevant to the centaur or the suburbanite who flies. No matter how much you believe that God exists, it's not going to really raise that there. Whereas at least since Jesus is in a, a Jewish religious context, if we have reason to believe that the Jewish God exists, then at least that's got relevance to it. And similarly, it can channel evidence back the other way, that when we come to have evidence that Jesus rose, that's going to channel the evidence back the other way to the proposition that the that God exists as well. So it acts as a channeling uh, proposition in the middle through which streams of evidence can flow without any loops ever actually taking place, which is why mutual support is consistent with foundationalism. So there's your, your really geeky part of all of this. So come back next time when we try to move on and discuss some things like the liar, lunatic, or Lord, which are more specifically about Jesus and provide some more specific arguments that he actually won the race, that he really was sent by God uh, beyond just that God exists and prophets are a thing. So maybe he was one of them. So I hope you like and subscribe and come back next time. Thanks for watching.